Welcome to Traditions at Wyzetta Community Church. My name's John Ross, part of the pastoral team here, where our vision is to inspire the world with the inclusive love of Jesus. The question for this season of Lent for us is, what does love look like? As our theme for Lent in 2021, we are asking, answering, and living the answers to that question. Our aim is to transform the pain of this past year into love rather than transmit it back into the world as, as just more pain. Through the weeks of Lent, we will see that love looks like forgiveness, empathy, inclusion, servanthood, and sacrifice, of course, among other things. But beyond these online services and sermons, we're offering in-person worship every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in our sanctuary, daily email devotions, small groups, an outdoor self-guided prayer pilgrimage around our building starting March 3rd, and a weekly Live Love Challenge, an invitation to personal daily spiritual discipline. So join us on this journey of Lent. Today, we build on the theme of last week, forgiveness, by turning to what is a learned and practiced behavior, empathy. So in a spirit of worship, let's greet those that are around us, with a smile or a hug, let's light a candle to acknowledge the presence of the Spirit and let's worship God together. heart and full assurance of faith, let us pray. Loving God, we come from the wanderings of our lives into this journey of Lent, knowing that we go only where you have gone before. You call us to be your people and to love your people with the love that you have given and instilled in us. Let us be quick to love, steadfast in community, 
and willing to walk with each other through all circumstances of life. Let us rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep and live in harmony with one another. May it be so. Amen. We find evidence of empathy throughout Scripture, but Paul gets right to it in what has been referred to as a job description for a Christian. This is in the 12th chapter of his letter to the church in Rome. Romans 12 is familiar to us, at least part of it is, the benediction that I speak at the close of services. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you from within. Now beyond that, it is a lyrical answer to our question of the season, what does love look like? So let's listen now as Jody Nyberg reads, and let's really lean in on the final verse. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, starting in verse nine. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. As a gift of your Spirit, O God, Open the eyes of our hearts, for we want to see you. Amen. It was early September 1998. I was serving as an associate minister at First Community Church in Columbus, Ohio, where I grew up, and was given the opportunity to preach weekly at our North Campus, to be the consistent leader and communicator in a new worship service intended to meet growing attendance demands and to reach new audiences. With three miles between our two campuses and limited time on Sunday mornings, the senior minister at the time invested in me to give leadership to this new worship service. I was only 31 years old at the time and this was a big but welcome assignment for me. It was the start of a new program year, a logical time to begin something new. There was energy in the building as the sanctuary was packed for the earlier service and people were starting to arrive for the next service, the new service, my debut as a weekly preacher. I went back to my office to grab my microphone and my worship folder when I noticed an envelope at the end of my desk closest to the door and it had my name on it. Without much thought, I quickly opened it up, unfolded the two pieces of paper that were stapled together, and began reading. I was immediately confused because although the envelope was addressed to me, the letter inside was written to our senior minister, Dr. Richard Wing. As I read, I realized why. It said, Dear Dr. Wing, in giving the weekly preaching assignment at the North Campus to John Ross, you have made a critical error and a big mistake. The letter went on in painstaking detail for two pages about why I was unprepared, ill-equipped, and generally incapable as a weekly preacher. Now, I have to admit it was a real page turner and I couldn't put it down. But in the interest of time and out of raw curiosity, I skipped to the end to see who it was from and have never forgotten the name, Anonymous. I guess it could have been worse. It could have been signed by one of my preaching professors in seminary or signed by my dad or Sheila, but it wasn't. In fact, it wasn't signed at all. Ever since that September day, if an envelope addressed to me personally doesn't have a return address on it, the first thing I do is skip to the end and look for a signature. 
If there is no name or it is signed by the cowardly person known only as anonymous, the letter is in the shredder before I read a single word of it. Now, I've debated this approach both inwardly and with colleagues over the years, each time deciding to just stick with it, not only for my own mental health and well-being, but for that of the church. This has been a rule of mine ever since, at least, that is, until last Thursday. But I'll come back to that later. Today we're considering love that looks like empathy. Empathy is defined as the ability to understand the feelings of others. But full empathy goes beyond just feelings and into understanding behavior as well. Not only to fulfill the call of Paul to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, we take up this challenging form of love for the healing of our divided world. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to be quick to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. That's good and that's godly pastoral care. But it's a whole lot easier than empathy for someone with whom we strongly disagree or who has, by their behavior, intentionally hurt us. Like forgiveness, this sort of empathy is hard work. But what of lasting value comes easily? Empathy requires what Buddhists call a strong back and a soft front because it's heavy lifting with a heart tuned to love. Empathy for someone you dislike or disagree with or who has hurt you is what love looks like and it's what following Jesus challenges us to do. But because empathy takes so many forms, I'm going to offer two examples of what empathy is not and then let you explore what it is on your own. First, empathy is not endorsement. Jesus was leading a revolution of love and peacemaking. He wasn't interested in or even trying to start a new religion that worshiped him. He was laying his life on the line every day to help people see the world and one another differently in new ways than they ever had before. He was crossing borders, literally, philosophically, ethnically, and religiously, coming face to face with people of all sorts from all kinds of places. He was serving in an occupied land that demonstrated might and force over love and peace. And he was able to empathize with all these different characters without endorsing their views or their behaviors. Remember just last week from the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Empathy without endorsement. And remember the days of Holy Week leading up to that crucifixion moment when from Pontius Pilate to the leaders of his own religion, Jesus displayed unimaginable empathy without endorsement. His ability to understand people who sought to destroy him did not lead to him accepting, affirming, or endorsing their views. And in a tender, midday moment with a woman from a different culture drawing water from a well, Jesus empathized without endorsing behavior. Dylan Marin is a digital creator. He, he creates content specifically for the internet. He is an openly and unapologetically gay man, and for that reason alone has received hideous online vitriol from people across the ideological spectrum. After attempts to ignore it and efforts to fight back against it, he decided to take on a different strategy, empathy. He started reaching out to the very people who not only disagreed with him, but who were intentionally trying to hurt him. In the rare instances that people would accept a conversation with Dylan, he always began with a question about the awful things that the person had written about him online. He would simply ask, why did you write that? And in most cases, Dylan found that this approach led to empathy. 
to love without the requirement of endorsement. Now, second, empathy is not deference. Again, we look to the actions and behaviors of Jesus. Since empathy is what love looks like, and since love is a verb. As the fifth of six kids in my family, it makes perfect sense to me that Jesus was a firstborn child. I don't mean to generalize or paint with too broad of a brush, but older siblings can be pretty rough and tough on the younger ones and on other family members as well. But in my experience, it's almost always out of love, love that looks like empathy. You see, older siblings, like Jesus to the disciples, have more life experience, more wisdom, because they've already been where the little sister or brother is standing. Empathy comes easily, but empathy does not mean deference. It doesn't mean letting someone you love hold a hateful idea or behave badly or make the same mistakes you made. Jesus could be pretty rough on the disciples at times, pointing out their failures and their faithlessness, but always motivated by love that looked like empathy, a true understanding of the feelings of another without deferring to them. Theo Wilson had empathy. He wanted to understand the feelings of a whole group of people, the alt-right that right-wing white supremacy movement. Now, because the alt-right is primarily an online movement, it was easy for Theo to join up, to enter their digital echo chamber and to establish his own digital footprint under the online identity of Lucius 25, white supremacist lurker. Very quickly, Theo was able to understand the feelings and the behaviors of others in this group, to empathize with them since it was a steady diet of hate and racism. But it never meant deference for Theo, because you see, Theo is African American. Theo found himself in the unfamiliar territory of empathizing with people for whom he held righteous contempt, those he could not have possibly disagreed with more, and who would wish him personal harm. In a TED Talk about his experience infiltrating the alt-right movement, Theo relates how this empathy without deference drew out compassion for those who hated him, getting him to a point of understanding, releasing fear, and embracing curiosity. Not enough people are willing to take that journey, according to Theo. Empathy without deference leads to courageous conversations, which also, according to Theo, is the last tool we have as humans before we start picking up rocks and guns. My friends, there is no way out of being human. So if we can't get out of it, we got to get into it. Love that looks like empathy is the path we see in Jesus. And it's the path we need today as much as ever. Empathy, the ability to understand not only the feelings of others, but their behavior as well. Empathy, without endorsement or deference, is what love looks like. Oh yeah, back to last Thursday. When I arrived in my office, there was an envelope on my desk addressed to me but I didn't notice the absence of a return address because it's been so long since I got an unsigned letter from my old friend, Anonymous. But as I began to read what was a very strongly worded letter, old feelings rose up in me. This time the letter was addressed to me because now I'm the senior minister, and as I read words that were screaming off the page, I intuitively looked to see who it was from. It was signed, but not with a name. It was signed by a grandparent who cares. The contentious content of the letter matters not. The plain disregard for empathy does. And I gotta tell you, I'm glad I read the letter before taking it to the shredder 
because now I better understand their feelings on an important issue, and I'm rethinking my previous approach to unsigned letters. But it's a real shame that no name was attached. It could have led to a courageous conversation, mutual understanding, even without endorsement or deference from either side. It could have led to empathy, what love looks like. So our Live Love Challenge this week is to write a letter to someone with whom you strongly disagree. Spend a few minutes each day composing this letter, revisiting it. Be sure to tell them why you wrote the letter and invite them into a courageous, empathy-filled conversation. Oh yeah, and be sure to sign it. Amen.
Every January and February for about the last 12 years, Jody Nyberg and I have gathered together with a group of her fifth grade students to teach them about communion. I tell them the same thing every year, that in our tradition, communion is first and foremost a symbolic act. But we also make it clear to the kids that all are welcome at this table in our tradition. We believe this to be the largest, most inclusive table in the world, and a table at which is set a seat for all people of all time. All we have to do is come just as we are, not as we think we ought to be. But because these are symbols, we can continue this tradition to continue to share in this way, even at a distance and even from different places. All you need is something to represent the bread of life and something to, to hold as the cup of the new covenant. That bread might be a piece of toast or an English muffin. That cup might literally be filled with coffee. But if you hold them rightly, they can still hold the power over our lives to remind us of a night, a night of betrayal. And on the eve of his death, when Jesus was gathered with his closest friends and followers, and he took these common elements of bread and cup, and he made them uncommon from that day forward. He took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he held it out to them and, say, and said, Take this and eat it, all of you, and do so, remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he poured it out before them and declared it the cup of grace. And it is indeed a bottomless cup of grace made known to all of us for all times. So we gather now in a spirit of gratitude for these common gifts that we share now together even at a distance. We ask a blessing over these elements now as we share them with one another, the bread of life and the cup of grace. Please pray with me. Loving and gracious God, thank you for giving us the gift of empathy that we see in the life of Jesus. We pray that our own hearts will become an instrument of compassion in this world that desperately needs love. God, teach us to consider how others experience the world. Help us to understand that our reality and the reality of others may be different but that we share the same core desires in this world. Teach us to listen for shared feelings and for places of connection. Help us also to be curious and open to hearing differences. We come to you today, God, asking for the grace and the strength to follow your example in forming safe, caring, inclusive communities. Let us be disciples of goodness in this world, strong in our knowing that in each and every being there's a child of God worthy of your love and acceptance. Give us the strength also, God, to keep feeling empathy even when we are tired and broken. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We hope that in some way God spoke to you through our worship experience today. I know that our experience is complete with your presence. So please be sure to go and visit our website, wisettacommunitychurch.org, to see all that God is up to in this mission and ministry. And you can also go there to sign up for our in-person worship every Wednesday. But as you go into this new week, remember to write that letter, to live, love, challenge by, by writing that letter and being sure to sign it. And as you go into this new week, go knowing that you are a unique and unrepeatable miracle of God blessed to be a blessing. And don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you from within. For what does the Lord require of us? But to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with our God.